Hello, and welcome to this educational event hosted by the CERN Foundation, a program of the National Brain Tumor Society in collaboration with trusted partners from the ependymoma community. My name is Kim Walgren, and I'm the executive director of the CERN Foundation, a program of the National Brain Tumor Society. It is my honor to introduce our two guests that are joining us today. Dr. Amar Gajar is the director of neuro-oncology at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee, and has been a medical advisor to the CERN Foundation since 2006. Tamako Toland is the moderator of an online support group called Appendi Families and Appendi Parents and a parent of son Colin Hayward. Thank you both so much for participating in this effort and recognizing the need for quality and reliable information. The title of this video is Appendomoma Essentials and is specifically designed for families in the early stage of diagnosis and treatment of childhood ependymoma. Today, we'll, we will be discussing disease overview, including diagnosis, treatment, and the possibility of seeking a second opinion. So with that, Tamako, I'm gonna turn it over to you to begin the interview and any other remarks you wanna add. Great, thank you so much uh, for letting me participate. Dr. Gajar has really gone through this journey with our family since the beginning. And um, it's really wonderful to be able to talk to you and to try to help other families that are just starting down this road. Um, so I'm gonna start with um, a first question about um, how a pentamone was diagnosed. And so how does that happen? And what makes it different from other brain tumors in children? So very good question. How is a pandemoma diagnosed and how is it different from other brain tumors in children? So the first thing uh, that sort of begins the process is the symptoms, headache, vomiting, loss in milestones. And that prompts usually a visit to a pediatrician. Uh, it, you know, sometimes they call it a gastroenteritis, but when the symptoms persist, that usually prompts a scan. And that's the first step to know that you've got a brain tumor. Now, there are certain imaging characteristics which are typical of a pandemoma. So to a set of experienced eyes, we could say, based on the MR imaging, that this is most likely an ependymoma, particularly in the spinal cord or in the back of the brain known as the posterior fossa. But the real confirmation of the diagnosis of a pandemoma only comes when the child has surgery and then we examine the tissue under the microscope and do additional tests, which are now more recently in the molecular realm. So how are pandemomas different based on their anatomical location. So the three common locations are on the top of the brain, what we call supratentorial, and they have a very distinct molecular signature. Then we have the tumors which are in the back of the brain or the posterior fossa, which fall under two major types of molecular signatures, posterior fossa A and posterior fossa B. And then you have the spinal cord ependymomas which are typically mixed of papillary. There's one sort of histology which is predominant. And then we grade that depending on the aggressiveness of that tumor, how it looks under the microscope. So what is the standard treatment for a pandemoma? So what is the standard treatment for a pandemoma? The first principle of treatment is to try to do a sur safe surgical resection to try to get as much of the tumor out without hurting the child. And I think that's a key factor. Um, it requires an experienced neurosurgeon who knows his or her neurosurgical skill sets, whether they can go in, take out the tumor. Now, a pandemoma in the posterior fossa, which is the most common one, is a sticky tumor. 
So it sticks to the cranial nerves as the cranial nerves exit the side of the brain or the brain stem. So many a times when trying to do over aggressive surgery, the children's cranial nerves are unfortunately cut and giving children a lot of difficulty following surgery, particularly with swallowing and voice, um, and even sometimes breathing and coordinating, um, you know, their entire swallowing um, in circuitry. So I think what we recommend is if you're in a smaller place and if it's an emergency, go ahead, debulk it. We learned that we can give a couple of rounds of chemotherapy and go back in and then get a gross total or near gross total resection of the tumor. And that reduces the amount of post-surgical morbidity that these children suffer. So after surgical resection and then studying the tissue under the microscope, the next big step is in most cases, uh, is radiation therapy. And radiation therapy, you know, there are two types. The traditional way was photon. Now we've got a newer methodology called proton radiation therapy. Um, and there are pluses and minuses of each of these. So important to go to an experienced center who have treated these patients and know the nuances of treating patients with proton radiation therapy, because sometimes if we don't plan the dose correctly, particularly at the back of the head, you can injure the brain stem and cause problems. And then the last part of the therapy, and this is something which is evolving, is the potential to add chemotherapy. So there was a long-standing sort of thought process which said chemotherapy did not work, the patients did not respond to chemotherapy. So for almost a decade and a half, chemotherapy was used only at the time of relapse. There is some emerging data which now needs to be confirmed and hopefully we will have that confirmation in the next six months, whether chemotherapy post-radiation therapy is helpful in a subset of patients that have more aggressive disease. And I think um, along with, with all the advances in treatment, I mean, there've been a lot of advances in the molecular diagnostics, uh, which have also fine-tuned what our approaches are and which patients need to be treated a little bit more aggressively. Thank you, um, Dr. Gajar. So along those lines, and just kind of getting some more detail, what is the role of chemotherapy today, traditionally with children with a pneumoma? So there has been a recently closed study by the Children's Oncology Group, which randomized or half the patients got chemotherapy, the other half did not get chemotherapy. And the early data did show that the patients which got chemotherapy benefited. Now this has to be analyzed in a little bit more detail and we need to review this in a peer-reviewed publication. So while, as I, and I think this data will be out in the next six months, right now, if patients have an anaplastic ependymoma or have any other aggressive features, I think the treating physicians are using chemotherapy. It's a very bland uh, grade two ependymoma uh, with no uh, aggressive molecular or clinical features, uh, then I think it's a toss up whether chemotherapy will benefit or not. And are there multiple chemotherapy options? Is that something where uh, families well, should I, talk? Yeah, I think the if you were to use chemotherapy, we would use chemotherapy as was used on the COG study because that's the one which has showed some efficacy. Yes, there's multiple chemo. I mean, I, that regimen is also fairly simple. It's not a very complicated regimen. But I think going beyond that uh, would, would have no real justification. So I think one has to be very careful. So when should families seek a second opinion? 
So when should family seek second opinions? Very, very important question. I think, you know, obviously this is this kind of diagnosis is a shock. I mean, you're, you're carrying on with your life. Everybody's busy, multitasking, working hard, paying the bills, looking after family. And now you've got a child who's gravely ill um, with a potential lethal disease. And I think, you know, there's lots of avenues for parents to seek information. Uh, there's the famous Dr. Google. There are sites like the CERN uh, NBTS sites. There's a chat group where parents such as you, uh, Tamiko, who have been through this whole journey and are knowledgeable about the, you know, the disease and the side effects are there to guide families. It really, the first thing I would recommend is, are you having a good rapport with your current treating team? Do you think that you're getting the kind of synchronized care that you need? Um, and are the physicians willing to spend time with you? Do they have a good rehab unit? Do they have a access to a proton therapy radiation? I think those are the questions that have to be really sort of sought after. It is always good, I think, in these rare diseases, if possible, to try and get a second opinion just to make sure that you are on the right track and if there's something that is obviously missing. But the key to that answer is really the tissue. Because just calling a physician saying, my child has got a pandemoma, really today's day and age doesn't help. And I think that's where it becomes tricky because the tissue is limited. And if you start sending it out to five different centers across the place, you're gonna get limited return and you're running out of your tissue should you need it down the road for some of these newer things that are now coming out. So I think one second opinion, always helpful just to make sure I just did one this morning on you know, another child who's in a prestigious institution and the differences of opinion of how to treat. So I think getting somebody that you feel, yes, I'm on the right track, uh, gives you that sense of reassurance. Um, but I think the key thing is to really get the tissue and the imaging in the hands of the right people. Great, so um, how useful is uh, a lumbar puncture, also known as an LP or a spinal tap when it comes to a pandemoma? That would change the treatment uh, plan because you would have to then, if you're considering radiation, consider you know, more extensive radiation, which again, in the younger child brings another whole host of issues. The incidence of metastatic disease by spinal tap is less than 5% in newly diagnosed appendemomas. So I think for the first time, just to be thorough and to be very, um, compulsive and make sure that you're not missing anything, um, I think it's recommended. And some subsequent follow-ups, unless there's a clinical reason, there's probably no need to repeat it. There are certain high-risk patients where we would recommend following with spinal taps. And now there's new technology which is coming by which we can even follow the circulating uh, DNA in the CSF to see whether you've got tumor cells still floating at a sub-microscopic level. Again, that's not ready for prime time. Uh, we've just going to, we've just done a big series and analyzed that information for some other tumors. But this kind of technology may be something that may be useful in certain high-risk patients. You had earlier mentioned the fact that epinomoma cells are very sticky. So it seems like um, the, any new technology that would aid in identification of the presence of cells might be helpful because so often we see that, that kids are having a negative LP, which is a positive, <laughs> um, but it's not necessarily definitive about the, the spread of disease. Am I understanding that correctly? 
Yeah, you're right. But again, I think we need to do a lot more studies to see if you have a positive fluid test based on a molecular testing, what does that really mean? So I think we need to invest and follow patients longitudinally and, uh, and then get some guidelines developed. Great, so, um, so what is the role of pathology for a panoma? I have to say, you know, I, I've seen many pathology reports and uh, they can be very difficult to wade through because you, there, there's a lot of different information on there. And I'm wondering, you know, particularly about tumor grading, but then there's other information that can appear on those reports. It's a very good question. What is the role of the pathology report? So I think what you're asking is, what do the role of traditional histology and tumor grading? Um, so people argue, that what does grade two versus grade three mean in the current era when we've got a lot more molecular diagnostics to sort of help us uh, identify the aggressiveness of the tumor? So in a, in a decade which passed, what a grade three tumor told you was this was an aggressive tumor. And a grade, t, grade two tumor was a bland tumor. But the new pathology reports are now going to reflect the new WHO classification, which has uh, been uh, worked on and it should be out for public consumption pretty soon. The early articles are coming out. So we look at the immunohistochemistry, we look at the fish or the molecular changes. We now most places are trying to get a methylation profiling on these tumors. And then obviously the big uh, test is the sequencing and um, is a whole genome and RNA-seq. So that's, that's the whole gamut. Now every center is not going to be able to do this. So most of the smaller centers have contracted these expensive um, tests out to either a commercial lab or a bigger academic center, which runs them on a regular basis based on the large volume of samples that they receive. So really treating a pandemoma in 2021 onwards, all of these bits and pieces of information are adding some insight into the tumor for the treating physician. So if you have a posterior fossa ependymoma, you would want to know if it's PFA or PFB. PFA is very common in the pediatric age group. As you get older, it's PFB. If it's a PFA tumor, then you want to know if the HCK27 is, you know, not, it typically is not mutated, but whether it's trimethylated or not. So that's another hallmark. If you go buy fish, you want to see whether you have the one Q gain. So every little test is giving you some more detail uh, about these tumors. If it's a supratentorial tumor, you want to know if it's C11 or uh, you know, relay translocation, whether it's a relay, um, you know, other, other sort of translocation involving the relay gene. Then you want to know whether there is a particular gene called CDKN2A to A to B, which is deleted or not. So each of these things are giving insights about the tumor, which can we can predict the aggressiveness of the tumor. Can you talk about the different molecular subtypes and how they affect treatment decisions today? Yeah, so what are the molecular subtypes and how are they affecting the treatment decisions? So the molecular subtypes, um, are now standard sort of lingo for treating physicians, pathologists, uh, surgeons, and neuroradiologists. So if you have a tumor in the top of the brain, a supratentorial, it's most often a C11 or relay fused uh, tumor. Now, it, if you get a complete clean gross total dissection, um, I think people are still advocating um, a, at least radiation therapy. If it's a YAP1 fused tumor, people, and you get a nice, clean, gross total resection, those tumors are doing amazingly well. 
and people are advocating, why not just follow those tumors? For the posterior fossa tumor, either A or B, there is a clear consensus, they all need radiation therapy. But the ones which are the aggressive ones with the 1Q gain and the HCK27 non-trimethyl, I think those are the tumors which need to be watched carefully. And that's a group of tumors which does overall poorly. And, and that's where the big concentration is for newer approaches and newer therapies. PFBs in general do well. And then for the mix of papillary ependymomas, if they're local and you can get the re resection, then uh, again, depending on the, on the surgeon's impression and how confident they feel, we generally tend to follow them unless there's a reason the CSF is positive or there's metastatic spread that we go ahead and radiate. So it really seems like there's still a lot that we need to understand about the different molecular subtypes. And um, there, there's a much more refined understanding um, that we're working towards. So for families that hear certain information, but it doesn't necessarily affect treatment, like how are they supposed to view this and, and how are we moving forward? So how, how do families handle this avalanche of molecular information, which is coming at them at a faster pace than you know, most people can keep up with? So my recommendation is to really have that wrap up with your treating physician. The treating physician really needs to sit down, take that report, explain it to them, tell them what information out of this is relevant to their child and what information out of this is extraneous. I mean, science will keep on moving forward uh, and thank God, uh, you know, that there are so many bright people who have dedicated their lives to this. And um, in, in, you know, just in the three decades I've been in this field, you know, what we thought of a pandemic when I started and what we are thinking about it now is a paradigm shift. And I tell my young people, I said, whatever you're going to do, make sure that you're involving your research in doing a paradigm shift. Or it's not doing the same old, same old. So I think that's going to happen. Now, over teasing it and over making it more complex than it needs to be probably, you know, confuses the parents more than helps them. So I think um, there are lots of um, articles which have come out, a lot of review articles, a lot of diagrams which have come out, you know, to try to explain. Um, but I think ultimately the treating physician and the family have to sit down and kind of get their heads around it. So there's a question that comes up a lot in our group around whether or not a penomoma has a genetic component. So I'm wondering if you can shed some light on that and also talk about when it's appropriate for a family to be referred for genetic counseling for the entire family. So again, this is a genetic counseling and genetic testing has opened up a new field. Uh, there's been a lot of think tanks across the country at the NCI, particularly since this is extremely sensitive information that is now coming in you know, on, on tablets and people's phones because parents have demanded access to this information. So it's a two-way street. Uh, it, how can this information be used and how can it be misused? So we do sequencing on a lot of these tumors and Again, the bigger places are also doing germline testing. So in case there is something on the germline, uh, that should trigger a more thorough discussion with the family and a further evaluation of the family. So right now, apart from NF2 and spinal cord ependymomas, there's nothing that common that we're seeing in regular ependymomas. Um, that the cancer predisposition syndrome type. But heck, we, when we started the Medulo genomics, we kind of had a hint. There were a few patients which had, you know, kindreds, which had the genetic predisposition and doing thousands of patients, you know, between North America and Europe and pooling on the data now we clearly have 
a larger pool of patients which are genetically predisposed. And then certain subgroups like sonic hedgehog where 25% of the patients may have a genetic predisposition. So again, this is an evolving field. It's just a question of getting that mass and studying it uh, and, and delving into the data deep with the current technologies and the future technologies that will be available. Uh, so it's not a static answer. Uh, it will keep on moving. The goalposts will keep on moving. So I guess I'd appreciate hearing if you can share um, how often do you actually refer families today when their child has a pedomoma for further genetic counseling? All patients. Uh, if you are going to do sequencing, then it's obligated by the NCI guideline that you provide genetic counseling to the, uh, to the patient family. So all patients get referred. Another question that I receive quite frequently is about clinical trials. And I know the purpose of our discussion today is for newly diagnosed. I mean, I want to stick to that, but is our clinical trials for newly diagnosed something that we should be um, pointing people to, or is that not an option at this point? Well, right now there are no frontline clinical trials that I'm aware of. I think um, the only way we will make progress is to design good clinical trials and treat patients so that we can get proper follow-up and get unbiased data, which is monitored by the statisticians and analyzed according to the plan. Um, so this is a void in the field currently but I know people are working, people have got some nice ideas. Uh, so I think in the next 12 to 18 months, hopefully we'll be able to come up with a clinical trial. And this question is for both of you. Um, Tamako, you have so much experience, lived experience with ependymoma and Dr. Gajar, your expertise of dealing with thousands of patients with ependymoma. What non-medical advice do you have for families that are going through this diagnosis? Tamiko, do you want to go first? I can, certainly. Okay. Um, you know, my primary advice for families is to really focus on what your actual goal is as a family and to consider your own needs when you're making a decision. Because you may hear the best advice and, you know, about the best centers, but maybe that's not the best choice for you as a family. So um, I think it's very important when families are considering making any medical decision to understand that that is their own decision and it does not have to match maybe what they're hearing externally, um, but they really need to kind of own, own that and feel that it's okay for them to say, this is the right thing for us. So from my perspective, what the best thing for families is, you know, take care of yourself. Take a, you know, have some parents help you. Take a break. Spend some one-on-one -on -one time with your other children. And if you can, unplug a little bit and even spend some time with your spouse because these journeys are long and they take a huge toll on a lot of aspects of family life. Personal, financial, you know, the child who's left behind feels resentment. So I think these are areas that, as Tomika says, one has to figure out what works for you, what works for your family. You know your friend circle, you know your um, family circle, and ask for help. And most people, I mean, will come and help. But don't burn yourself. And I often tell families when they're newly diagnosed, I mean, the first three weeks, everybody's boring. And then gradually everybody peels off and then you're left, uh, you know, pretty lonely and it's tiring. I mean, you know, I, I, uh, I was sort of very concerned during the COVID epidemic when we had to restrict caregivers to only one caregiver per child. And I understood that was for the safety of the child and the parent but it takes a huge toll. You know, when you've got a sick child, you constantly, you, you know, you're worried about what's going on at home. So I think 
taking a holistic approach and getting yourself help, don't let yourself run down completely. Uh, I think, it's, and it, it, you and, and as Tamika said, this is something that it needs to be a conscious decision. Uh, unfortunately, there are situations where families are split and mothers uh, would generally the primary caretakers have no other choice, but by far, um, you know, if you can get help, um, take care of yourself. That's really great advice. <laughs> and, you know, so Dr. Kajar, you've seen a lot of children survive long-term and you've also seen a lot of children pass away from this disease. So tell me what gives you hope? What gives me hope in this field, which is a tough field, cancer in general is tough, is the fact that we are constantly working and chipping away. So one of the new sort of areas that we are exploring is how to trick these cells. So traditionally, our thought process was we've got to kill them. And unless we kill them, we these, these tubers are going to come back. But now we are sort of thinking of them in a little different way. We're thinking of what are they, what is metabolically driving the cells inside the cell? And can we use chemicals to change the inner metabolism, which may change what is driving the cells to multiply. So that is one kind of approach is to fool them. Um, the other big area, which is still in its infancy and has not shown some amazing side effect, but I, as uh, efficacy, but I think which will emerge is the whole field of immuno-oncology. So again, for brain tumors, these are immunologically cold tumors. They don't have the right cell population to attack the tumor cells. Um, there are lots of approaches now that are being tested, uh, vaccines and CAR T cells and antibodies. And we are learning at a fairly rapid rate what is working, what is not working, what needs to be tweaked. So if I were sitting here and if I contemplated for the next 10 years, we're going to do the same thing. I would, I would be very worried about the field. But fortunately, we've got people who are thinking about this in completely different terms. The, and I don't want to give you a big detailed molecular lecture, but the finding that the molecular changes in the ependymoma cells is similar in the high-grade glioma, uh, gives us some inside clue of what, what are the changes which are taking place and what is driving these tumors. So even in the last five years, though clinically we've lagged behind, and I know you and Kim and many other parents are sort of frustrated, um, but I'm sure now we are on the cusp of got, getting some smart approaches uh, that we're ready to test prime time. So. Wonderful, thank you. A sincere thank you, Dr. Gajar and Tamako for participating in this event today and helping to explain these important pediatric ependymoma essential information. Thank you to the team at the National Brain Tumor Society who helped produce this session and the scientists who have dedicated their entire careers to advancing the understanding of this disease and especially the patients and family members to participate in these efforts and share so much of their lived experience with us that we can all work together towards finding a cure for this disease. Please reach out to us if you need support, have feedback, or have other questions about this educational event. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>